Christ is among us. We are very honored to, to have Father Michael among us today for this retreat. And uh, as I shared with um, our parishioners in an email yesterday, I was very blessed to listen to Father Michael for the first time 10 years ago. It was uh, during Great Lent in 2006 when Father Michael came to Regina, invited by Father Yonutz, who is uh, his godson. And uh, as I said, you know, that was the first time I listened to Father Michael speaking at the University of Regina, giving a presentation about uh, the spread of Christianity and the spread of the Orthodox Church, starting from Macedonia. <laughs> starting with Alexander the Great. And I'll never forget that talk, how he connected the spread of uh, the Macedonian Empire and the Greek culture, and then how Christianity came into, into the picture and how uh, uh, Christianity took advantage of the Greek language to spread the gospel. And then uh, I listened to Father Michael uh, at the retreat on Saturday that day, and I felt so energized and at that time, I was still uh, a fresh priest who came from Romania, and uh, I was still writing my sermons and reading them on Sundays because I, I was not feeling confident, you know, to preach freely in English. The next day on Sunday, after listening to Father Michael for that weekend, I said, Lord, give me strength. No papers today. <laughs> And I gave a sermon with no papers that day, and somebody came to me after the Holy Liturgy and told me, Father, I liked your sermon today. I hope you are going to preach like that from now on. <laughs> and from then on, by the grace of God, I tried to preach like that and to, you know, to, to, to give so much joy in how, you know, when, when, when I speak to the people. And thank you very much, Father Michael, for inspiring me personally. Thank you very much for sharing with us your love for God, your love for the church, and your knowledge about Alaska, about the saints of Alaska, about the, Orthodox, the orthodoxy in North America. God bless you, and thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Father. <coughs> thank you very much, Father Cosmin. I, I'm going to actually use the saints of Alaska as my structure. St. Herman, St. Innocent, St. Yaakov. But before we go there, um, if he mentioned Father Yanutz, who I met in, uh, in Suchava, Romania, almost 20 years ago. It's amazing that it could be so long ago. And last night, if you were at uh, St. Andrew's Church, I spoke about, my theme was, nothing happens by accident. Uh, an idea that I, as I mentioned yesterday, I re rejected when I first read it. It was in the Diary of a Russian Priest, published by St. Vladimir's. Father Elchaninev wrote, nothing happens by accident. Anyone who believes in accident does not really believe in God. And I thought, that can't be true. But the older I get, the more I'm convinced that it is true. And let me tell you, before I even begin, this story. I went to Romania for the first time uh, because I had a conference in Germany, a World Council of Churches cons consultation on mission. And be because I'm a priest from a small village in Alaska, I've got invited to a lot of these kind of events. I went to Alaska, I said, I'm going to be in Alaska in a small village, the world will go by and I'll just be where I want to be, in, my, in this one village and so forth. And then uh, it was Father John Meyendorf who called me up and said, Father, there's a world mission conference in Melbourne, Australia, and the OCA would like you to go. Melbourne, Australia, it's the other side of the world from top to bottom, right? And I went, and I met some people that are still some of my friends to this day. Then from there, because I could speak English, and the other Orthodox delegates either spoke only Greek or only Russian, they asked me for some Orthodox response to, I don't, to tell you the truth, I don't even remember what. But they gave me like, in five minutes, Father, after lunch, give us the Orthodox position on this. <laughs> so it was like condensing a dissertation into the bare essentials. But somehow whatever I said made sense to them. And they came to me, this is the first time that Orthodox made sense to us. Not just because I spoke English, but because I understood these are mostly Protestants. I live in a predominantly Protestant context. I knew, in a sense, how to communicate with them. Well, that made me somehow a superstar. I wound, I wound up going to Hawaii the next time, and then Germany, and then England, and then uh, Switzerland, and then 
uh, Cyprus. I'm supposed to be a priest in a little village in Alaska. I want to traveling all over the world. So this time I had this conference in Germany, and I'd been there several times. As long as I have to fly to Europe, I'm going to fly a little further to Warsaw and visit there. I have friends there. And then I'd like to go to Romania. This was in my mind. So when I... Nothing happens by accident. It was my theme last night. I got to Warsaw. I went to the seminary. I'd never visited the Orthodox seminary in Warsaw. And there was four or five students leaving at that time to visit their friends in Bucharest. And they were driving. There's room in the car. Come with us. We had this free ride to Romania. We got to Bucharest and they were visiting their friends and I got on the train to Suchava. The reason I wanted to see, if you don't know the geography of Romania, it's in the northeast corner of Romania. Bucharest is in the southeast corner. So I had to travel from the south part of Romania to the north. The reason I wanted to go to Suchava was because my roommate in seminary, his parents had come from Romania and he had, this is the only reason, he had a, a record album. Those of us who were old enough to remember vinyl records, right? He had a record album, Colinde, Christmas carols. Madrigal choir that sang wonderful Romanian Christmas carols, but the cover was the church at Voronezh. Now, if you know the church in Voronezh, it's frescoed not only on the inside, but more magnificently on the outside. And it's been frescoed like this for 500 years. 500 Romanian winters, and the church is still frescoed. DuPont never discovered this, this, <laughs> this secret. <laughs> but I want to see these. There's five of them, and that's why. So I get to Suchava. I have a guidebook. I flip it over. Suchava Hotels. I have no idea. I have no friends. I have no contacts. I pick. Bukovina Hotel. Well, that's appropriate. It's the name of the province. So the taxi the driver says, where do you want to go? Bukovina Hotel. Okay. They take me there. The whole lobby was this big. But on each wall, this size, were photographs of exactly these five painted monasteries. Since I don't speak Romanian, I could say to the hotel clerk, I want to go there. She said, fine, take the bus. <laughs> I said, and then I can want to go to that one. Well, you come back, you go there one day and come back. And the next day you go there and come back. She was planning for me to spend a week at this hotel, right? <laughs> I said, I don't have a week, I have three days. Can't I find a driver to take me? In one day, to visit all of them. She looked at me like, what a crazy idea. <laughs> no one in the history of Romania had this idea before, apparently. <laughs> she said, I'll check. The next morning I came. No, not today, tomorrow. Well, it's okay. So Chava has a beautiful monastery, St. John the New, other churches. I went and I prayed. The next morning, I came to the lobby. Yes, it was the hotel manager and the hotel car. He didn't speak English at all. He put me in the back seat and drove about a mile and pulled over to the curb and stopped. And he got out of the car and I sat there. <laughs> What's going on? I, he, then, after 20 minutes or so, came the now father priest, Yuan Mayarian, who's the priest in Kitchener, Ontario now. But he was a seminarian. And in very good English, he reached through the car window and said, Hello, I'm, I'm Yuan Yon Mayarian. I'll be your tour guide today. I said, you speak such good English. He said, did you learn in school? I said, no. He said, no, I didn't learn in school. I learned English from the Discovery Channel. <laughs> <laughs> and he, being a seminarian, he knew the history and the theology. So he was a very good tour guide. At the end, we exchanged um, addresses. We corresponded. The next year, I came back. He took me to Maramores, another part of Romania. The third year, I came back with my wife, and we saw the central part of Romania. And... I met his fiance, and they asked my wife and me, next year, can you come back? This is the fourth year now. Can we come back for the fourth year and be our godparents for our wedding? Well, we were honored. Of course we'll come back. We weren't planning to come back to Romania for the fourth year in a row, but okay, for the wedding, yes. And then the wedding was postponed, but we already had our tickets. So we went to Romania the fourth year and went back to Alaska. At Christmas time, we got a Christmas card. The wedding's back on. Can you come next year? Okay, so we came for the fifth year to for me the fifth year to Romania, and the reason it's funny the reason that it was postponed the wedding, the fiance the the wife the future wife's uh, father was against this marriage. 
He had never met Yanots, but he knew he was from Bukovina. <laughs> and and that he might take this girl, his daughter, all the way to Bukovina. <laughs> from southern Romania. From southern Romania. <laughs> it's too far, we'll never see her, absolutely he's against it. Then her brother got married, and the Yanuts came to the wedding, and the father actually met him. And they liked each other. Okay, you can marry my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> On my next visit to Romania, Father Yanuts was uh, not yet a priest, but he had a car. And he drove me to my relatives in Ukraine and Poland. And on this, on this trip, two weeks in the, his car, he mentioned to me, do you think Archbishop Nathaniel needs any English-speaking Romanian priests in America? I said, I don't know, but my roommate is the chancellor, I can check. And so, after another year of visa problems, he moved to Regina, Saskatchewan. And so I visited him several times there, and that's where Father Cosme and I met. Now, after all of this, when he told me, does he need priests in North America? I said, but Father, what about your father-in-law? He didn't want you to move your, his daughter <laughs> to Papukovina. How can you talk about moving to North America? Oh, he said, it was his idea. <laughs> <laughs> After all of this, I find out. What happened the first day in Suchava when the driver pulled over to the curb and let me sit there for half an hour? This is the story. I only found out now. That day, Yanuts was not supposed to be my tour guide. His sister, his older sister, is a professor of the English language at the university. She was supposed to be my tour guide. But that day, when her father came to pick her up, she had terrible flu symptoms. So at the last minute, he had to find his younger son who learned English from the Discovery Channel, <laughs> to be my tour guide. If she had not got the flu, his life would be different, and I wouldn't be here today. So we call this, in Romanian, Svinta Gripa. <laughs> <laughs> Holy flu. It rhymes in Romanian. <laughs> but you see, it can't be an accident. <laughs> and this is the background, another story of to emphasize again what I spoke about last night, the older I get, the less I believe that things happen just by, ac by coincidence or accident. Somehow, not at the time, not when it's happening, but when you look back, you can see how the hand of God was there guiding you each step. St. Innocent, when he uh, was dying, St. Innocent, the first bishop of Alaska, when he was dying in Moscow as the archbishop there, he said, don't preach any eulogies about me, Preach on this text, the footsteps of a man are guided by the Lord. And that's what, I don't know what the sermon was, but that's what his orders were. Don't talk about me, preach on this text. And we can see, and it will be part of my theme today, yet things don't happen by accident. God is really running, even, even against human sin and tragedy, God will still be there and use it for his purposes and to the salvation of souls. Now to begin my talk for today. How did Orthodoxy come to North America in the first place? Well, of course, if we go back to Macedonia, <laughs> and we won't go back quite that far, the, the Russian people had converted to Christianity the date is 988. But then within two centuries, the Tatars invaded. And they occupied what is now Ukraine and Russia for over 200 years. And in the 1400s, just before Columbus discovered America, they began to liberate their country from the Mongols. And the great battle at Kazan in the 1440s liberated the, uh, the European Russia from Mongol, from Tatar rule. But then, by, by default, the Tsars of Moscow became also the rulers of Asia. Because if you expel the Mongols, some nature at war is a vacuum. Someone has to take control. So it was almost like you could say by accident that <laughs> Moscow became the ruler of Siberia. Then Siberia, what's in Siberia? Some native tribes and a lot of trees. I've taken the Trans-Siberian Railroad. It's still to this day mostly trees. Lots of birch trees and then tundra and um, taiga. And, uh, and the Mongols go back to Mongolia and now there's this huge wilderness, twice the size of the 48 states. Who goes there first? Who ventures into the wilderness first? The monks. The monks go there first. 
If we go back to the ancient monks of Egypt, why did St. Anthony go to the desert? What was the desert? The desert is the land of the dead. It's where you build the pyramids. You, it's a, the desert is, is the cemetery. It's also the land of the dead because without water, nothing can live. So when the evil spirits are dead, when the Old Testament goes anew, the scriptures even say, they go, to the, they go to the wilderness, they go into the desert. It's the land of the devil. It's the devil's <coughs> land. It's the land of the dead. This is the desert. It's where you bury the dead. And Anthony the Great goes to a cave in the desert because you could say, in sort of cosmic terms, this is enemy-occupied territory. <laughs> this is the land where God, where the, where the life has been destroyed, where life has been eradicated, where you bury the dead and where everyone who goes there dies. And there, in that land, the land of the dead, the land of the devil, the enemy-occupied territory, Anthony the Great goes as a one-man D-Day invasion. If you think of it in these terms, you see, that's how 4th century people were thinking. And what's he going to do out there in the desert, in the land of the dead? Living in the cave where he himself will be buried. Living in advance in his own tomb. What's he doing in his tomb ahead of time? Praising God. Singing, re- reading the Psalms. <clears throat> Celebrating Pascha. Declaring in the land of the evil one, in the land of the dead, in the enemy-occupied territory, the victory of God. And he's joined in his lifetime by hundreds of others who are joining this movement to invade, you could say, enemy-occupied territory. It's a geographic movement. The movement then spreads to Syria. And the Palestinian Christians move into the deserts of the Middle East and fill it with Praising God. Now when Christianity came to Russia, to Kiev, it turns out that the city of Kiev, where they were baptized, is also built over a series of limestone caves. A honeycomb of limestone caves. <coughs> Hundreds of limestone caves. So that when, they came, the monks, when the Christians came to convert this, the people in Ukraine, they found the caves. Well, you know where they went. They went underground. <laughs> and the monastery of the caves is still commemorated even in our Litya prayers, Anthony and Theodosius of the caves in Kiev. And the caves, by the way, are still there. And during the Soviet period, they never quite closed even that monastery, although they outgrew the caves. But if you go, if it's an absolutely amazing place to go. The caves, the monks who died and lived in those caves, are buried in those caves. And they're incorrupt. They're aligned there, hundreds of them, as if asleep waiting for the resurrection on the last day. And the, the pilgrims now come by the thousands. You think the crowds are big at Disneyland? <laughs> In lines like that, just to come, to enter those caves and venerate the relics and the icons of those saints. Now, when, back to my theme, when Siberia was suddenly opened under Russian rule, the monks are the first ones to go. There's no desert like Egypt, but there's plenty of places where you wouldn't want to live. So cold, so inhospitable, enemy occupied territory where you will die. <laughs> and the monks go there. And they live, they dig their own caves. And they, live, and they be- begin forming monastic communities. And the local Siberian tribes, who are mostly nomadic, they don't have cities or towns, they come through and they, it's on their trade route or their, their um, place where they always fished or the place where they always hunted. They come and now there's. These strange people with long beards and funny hats occupying the place. And of course they enter into a conversation. And Siberia ultimately was evangelized by the monks who moved beyond the frontiers of the empire, set up their little monastic community, and then in conversation with the local Siberian people, they learned their language. Many of them around Kazan uh, learned and even developed alphabets for these Siberian languages, translated the scriptures and the uh, church services into the local tribal languages and began the conversion of those people. The University of Kazan was for Siberia, um, founded by monks to start with, but became the center for the study of the languages and the cultures of the Siberian people. So this was going on from the 1400s. So, now, Alaska. If you look at the globes that were made in the 1700s, even the 1700s, 
the whole globe is mapped. Your patents had been everywhere. <laughs> South America is mapped, Africa is mapped, Asia is mapped, Europe is mapped, and all of North America except where Alaska is today. It's empty. No Europeans had gone there. They had no idea what was there in that one quadrant of the world where no one had explored yet. So Peter the Great, on his, on his deathbed in 1728, decided to send an explorer from the Russian Navy, which he had just, be, just started, to, to venture into that area and map it. And his instructions, Peter the Great wrote by his own hand, go to build a ship, which means carry all the wood because there isn't any on the Pacific coast. Carry all the lumber you need to build a ship out to the Pacific Ocean, build a ship and sail along the coast until you come to America. Because every geographer in Europe believed that the two continents were connected. And if you came to the Asian side, just north of Korea, and sailed along the coast, eventually you would keep right on coming until you wound up maybe in San Francisco, <laughs> somewhere in North America. That was the goal. That were his, those were his orders. So Bering, Vitus Bering, the captain of this ship, did as the Tsar ordered. He built a ship. He sailed along the coast until he came not to America, but to the Arctic Ocean. It was everyone's surprise. The continents are not joined. It's water in between. And he went back and reported this. Now, according to our mythology, or maybe Russian propaganda, maybe both, in 1741, Bering was sent a second time to explore this area. The, the propaganda, I would call it, says that he was sent to do it the second time because the experts, the geographers in Europe, rejected the findings of his first voyage. It couldn't be true. Go back and do it again. And that's what we still teach in our Alaska history books, by the way. But it's clearly untrue. Why? Because Bering had two ships on his second voyage, the St. Peter and the St. Paul, the Pavel and the Petra, and he had the Peter, and the other captain, Alexei Chirikov, had the Pavel, the Paul. And they sailed not into the Bering Sea at all. They sailed straight east. If you have an idea where, what Alaska is shaped like, I don't know if some of you have been, there's our long straight border with Canada. It's the longest part of the border, about 800 miles long. And we have that border because Vitus Bering, sailing, that's where Alaska was discovered not way out close to Russia, but way on the other side. Because Vitus Bering, on the Feast of St. Elijah the Prophet, sighted an, uh, uh, the tallest coastal mountain in the world and named it Holy Prophet Elijah. It's badly translated into English as St. Elias. And he said basically, I hereby draw a line from the tip of that mountain to the North Pole, and everything behind me is now under Russian rule. However, Alexei Chirikov arrived one day earlier and landed way down at the, where, what is now the southern border of Alaska near Ketchikan. And he placed on, the, on, the, on a tree or a rock one of the several brass plaques that both ships had that said with a cross at the top, this land is under Russian protection. And they were, they were sailing along the, coast of, the southern coast of Alaska. They were supposed to place these plaques all along to stake Russia's claim to as big a chunk of North America as they could grab. But they didn't tell the British, the French, or the Spanish ambassadors that that's what they were up to. They said, Barry's going back to check it again. But it clearly isn't true. And that's why Alaska is shaped the way it is. We have that, that panhandle we call it that goes down along the Canadian border. Uh, depriving British Columbia of what would have been half of its coastline. And that's because Chitikov landed down there and Bering landed up. Now that's important for us because on the way home, Bering's ship was wrecked and Bering died. Chitikov, however, made it back in one piece, safe and sound. So Chitikov <coughs> got here first, one day early, and, and successfully returned to Russia. But you never heard of him before. Bering got here second, and died and never made it back, and he gets all the credit. It helps to be the boss. <laughs> they named the Bering Sea after him, but in memoriam. <clears throat> but the shipwreck is the most important event, not Chirikov's successful voyage. Why? Because Bering's men, the survivors, they didn't all die. They built a new ship out of the wreckage of the old, and they sailed back to Russia one year later. Everyone was surprised they had been given up as drowned, as lost. 
They came back with two things. Walrus tusks, ivory, very valuable in the Chinese trade, but more importantly, sea otter pelts. I should have brought some. My, we have one sample of sea otters at my house. I could have, if I've thought of it, I should have brought some. Sea otter is the thickest, densest, and also softest fur in the world. When they brought these furs to the Chinese market, the Chinese went crazy for it. A sea otter pelt would be worth, in modern terms, about $10,000. So you can understand how the cash registers were going off all over Siberia. How do we get more of these? <coughs> the only people who knew where the sea otters were were the survivors of Bering's shipwreck. So they began organizing little teams of their buddies to go back and trade for the sea otter pelts. They're called sea otters because they don't come ashore very often. They live in the sea. Uh, the local Unangan or Aleut people knew how to hunt them in their kayaks. These guys from Siberia had no way. They, they had no expertise in kayaking. They weren't used to being on the ocean. They couldn't go out there and hunt the sea otter. It was easier to trade, bring trade goods to Alaska and get the local native people to go hunt and then trade. So the trade began with blankets and frying pans and axes and knives and things made of metal that the, tri- that the native people would want. But it didn't take long for these from Promyshleniki, these entrepreneurs, these businessmen, they're called, that's what they're really called, uh, these frontiersmen, to discover that the Unangan people valued more than anything else blue beads. They valued a blue bead the way we would value a diamond. So you could go with 10, 20 blue beads in your pocket, it didn't take up a lot of room in your boat, trade for 10 or 20 sea pounds, times 10,000 beads and have a quarter million dollars worth of furs to take back, to trade. This is what happened. For 50 years, the frontiersmen were coming uh, to Alaska. They didn't have anything to build boats from. There was no wood. So they had to hunt elk or moose, tan the hides, and make leather boats. They looked like leather bathtubs. A little bigger, of course. Big enough to hold. But you can't build a a leather boat that will hold 100 people. You build a leather boat that holds five or six. And then you have to launch out into the Pacific Ocean and hope by God's grace that you'll get to Alaska somehow. And they did this over and over again. Now, our history books again say that the reason they did this was because there was so much money. Greed motivated them. But I've been studying this this era of our history for over 30 years. And as little information as we have, I've concluded now Greed did not explain their behavior. It's, first of all, much too risky to get into a skin boat and launch out to the North Pacific. One out of five voyages sank, but the 80% success rate was actually pretty high for those days. But then you come to the Aleutian Islands, you make friends, you trade, you give them the beads, they give you the sea otter pelts, you go back to Russia, then you have to go a thousand miles inland to, uh, to near Irkutsk to do the actual trading. So you had to go, that was the only trading post open for the Chinese-Russian trade. And it took about two years to get to Alaska and two years to come back. So in four years, what you made, 100,000, 200, you could retire. You are a very rich man. None of them ever retired as far as I know. Why? Because they they were frontiersmen. Uh, How can we compare them? In American history, we have people like this. Uh, maybe starting from Kentucky. <laughs> Davy Crockett, Daniel Boone, uh, Robert Redford, Jeremiah Johnson. <laughs> that kind of guy. Now they're rich. Do they, are they going to buy a mansion, put on a tuxedo, and go every night to the opera? No. They're allergic to that. So what do they do with this fortune? They party mightily. <laughs> Uh, they squander it. They give donations to God, to the churches, to the museums, to the orphanages, to the churches, to the monasteries, and in a couple of years, they're broke. And then they do it again. And again, and again. Four-year voyages. So you can only do this, life expectancy was shorter. You can only do this three, four, five, four, <coughs> by that time you were. So what gradually happened was this, exactly as it happened in Siberia. After the monks come into Siberia and start their monasteries, behind them came in Russia the frontiersmen. 
who set up their track lines, built their log cabins, their homesteads, fished, hunted, traded, if they needed money, traded furs and made a little bit of cash. And as the fur, as it got too crowded and the furs depleted, they moved further and further out along beyond the frontier. First come the monks, then come the frontiersmen. <coughs> America has the frontiersmen. We didn't have any monks, so they... <laughs> but you understand. It's, and that's how Siberia was settled. So the same thing happens in Alaska. These guys eventually say, you, you, my, my buddies, you go back, and you can have my share of the furs. I'm staying here. By that time, they had a girlfriend in the village. Every time they came back, they were hope. Is she ready for marriage? No, her father says she's too young. Come back next time. <laughs> they came back next time. They came with the dowry. <laughs> they, they, they gave the family whatever they asked for <laughs> in exchange for the permission to marry their daughter. And so uh, the, the frontiersmen, little by little, intermarried with the native people of Alaska. When the missionaries finally came in 1794, they were expecting to be able to preach the gospel and baptize the population, but they found the entire population already baptized. They found chapels in every village. All the frontiersmen had served as godparents, godfathers to each other's kids. The problem was there was no priest to legally marry the couples. So the first missionaries, instead of baptizing and chrismating the population, were very busy having one wedding after the other in the chapels that the frontiersmen had already built. Now, this is a forgotten chapter of Alaska's history and of our church history. And I mentioned it as the first installment because of this. Missionary work in America began with lay people. The priests came later. Isn't that the way most of the ethnic parishes were started? <laughs> right? The immigrants came, they banded together, with, very, with practically at the poverty level, and they pooled their resources to buy a piece of land, eventually to build a church, and then they said, well, no, I guess we need a priest. <laughs> right? <laughs> and then they wrote back to the old country and brought somebody over. Lay people laid the foundation of the church in this part of the world. It also laid the foundation of the church from the very beginning in Alaska. And I, I submit to you, therefore, my first missiological principle. Missionary outreach is the, the, the duty and responsibility of the laity. You say, no, isn't it the priest's job? I've had priests who thought that it was their job to do missionary work. They spend a lot of time with people who aren't Orthodox, hoping to convert them and bring them into the church. You know what the parish council said? Father... What about us? We didn't bring you into our parish and house and feed you so you can spend all your time with people who aren't even members. Right? Your responsibility is to be the pastor for us, the people who are already inside the church. So who's going to make contact with the people outside the church? The laity are outside the church every day working with people who are not necessarily even Christian, but alone Orthodox. If the church is going to grow, and this is the lesson from this ancient part of Alaska's history, it will be the responsibility of the laity not to preach, not to teach, because you know we're all afraid to mention it. They'll ask a question that will stump us. By the way, they can stump the priests too. It's not that. <laughs> that no, no, you don't have to know all the answers. It's the gospel lesson from last Sunday. All Philip had to say to Nathaniel was, come and see. Come and see. And if, if the Holy Spirit inspires them, they'll, they'll come again and again. And they'll borrow some books from the library or buy some from downstairs in the bookstore. This is the only way the church grows. You can't expect your priest to do it. And I guarantee you, if he starts doing it, you will be the first ones to complain. <laughs> Because he already has plenty to do ministering to the people who are already members of the parish. And that's what you expect of him. And that's perfectly legitimate and okay. So if the church will grow, it will be because there is some joy and some enthusiasm among the lay people. Not, the, not Jehovah Witness style, knocking on people's doors and imposing. No. Simply you meet someone who will notice your joy, your peace your spiritual essence and say, you know, 
what's with it? <laughs> how, how did, where'd you get this joy or this thing? Especially after Pascha, mm -hmm. right? Your joy should be by that time something infectious. <laughs> and we'll talk more about that at the end. But you see, this is where it starts. Someone, you don't go asking, you would be orthodox, so you go, what's that? Those people with the funny hats? No. <laughs> uh, but it will happen simply by being who you are and being involved with people outside the church. And then your responsibility, you don't have to answer any theological questions. Just do as Philip did with Nathan. Come and see. And let Holy Spirit take over after that. That's how churches, statistically, sociologically, that's what people who study this uh, tell us. Putting ads in the paper doesn't bring people in. There are ads for all kinds of religions in the paper, but why would you go there? 95% of the people who join any church join there because they had knew someone who already did that there. That's what brings people in. And I, so as I thought about this first chapter of Alaska's history, I realized it's the same. It's been the same since the beginning. It's the lay people who lay the foundations of the church and organize the parishes. And then the clergy come later. <clears throat> now, to move my, to my next chapter in Alaska, 50 years of this freelance competition, five, six, seven men in skin boats coming over uh, with a pocket full of blue beads and taking small amounts, a hundred pelts. See how the pelts are very heavy. It's the thickest, heaviest fur in the world. So it's, it's a half ton of, it's a thousand pounds of, of, of skins, of, of pelts in the boat. You can't take more than that. So a, a hundred would be a big shipment. Fifty would probably be more realistic. So these five, six guys each have ten. Well, that's a hundred thousand pounds profit. It was worth the trip. As they say at Dunkin' Donuts, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was worth the trip, and they squander it, and they come back, and they do it again. Now there's some thinking uh, investors <coughs> in Irkutsk, and they're watching this cavalcade of frontiersmen coming and going, coming and going. The only people really making the money uh, in the fur trade are those who own the saloons, <laughs> where they spend half their profits partying, and the other are charitable institutions, churches, monasteries, schools, and orphanages. But the, these businessmen are sitting watching this, what they consider waste, and say, you know, why don't we get involved? What if we could go to this place, Alaska, which still hasn't been mapped, and with a ship, or even two ships, better yet, three, and uh, bring home thousands of pounds. I mean, let's get serious. We'll go from thousands of dollars <coughs> cargo to millions. Yeah, sure, good idea. So after about 50 years, some businessmen in their courts get together. They've decided ahead of time not to bother with the blue beads because we're not going to get a sufficient number of pelts bargaining with one or two hunters at a time. We're going to need entire villages to do our bidding. Well, how are you going to do that? We'll bring cannon. So these investors not only equip three ships, but they equip them with... They're called cannon. They're really more like what we would call today bazookas. One guy can pick it up and carry it around. It shoots a cannonball the size of a baseball or the size of your fist. Just enough to scare people. And they already have this all planned out. We're not going to trade anymore with these people. We're going to extort the furs. Get out there and hunt, or there'll be consequences. So Gregory Shelikov, the, man, the head of this expedition, and his investors equipped three ships. The Russians were all very pious. They, built, they named their ships on the feast day on which they were launched. So w there's one named the Simeon and Anna from early February. There's another one from a few days earlier, the Three Hierarchs, based on the great Gregory theologian and dark system. And there's another one, let's say, Archangel Michael. But clearly they built these ships uh, on the Siberian coast, and then they set sail for Alaska with about 200 hired men, employees, not investors, not equal partners in a little shipping adventure, men who were employed by the, what they called Shelikov Golikov Company, named after the main investors. Who, and Shelikov himself was on the ship. The t first two ships sank the first week. The St. Michael, the Archangel, never made it to Alaska, neither did the Simeon and Anna. But the three hierarchs sailed past the Aleutian Islands to their target, Kodiak Island, where no Provostreniki had yet ventured. 
They're running fresh fur trading territory and a new batch of unwilling, in this case, hunters. So they established their trading post at Three Saints Bay, named for the name of their ship. Three hierarchs. It's still there. Uh, Shelikov claims he built a chapel. There's no evidence of that. But the, but the church that stands in the village there is still called Three Hierarchs. 1784. It's the first sort of established Orthodox church in the New World. Those chapels along the Aleutian Islands, most of them didn't have any names. This one, we know the name. 1784, Three Saints Bay, Three High Rocks Church. And then he, they had ransomed a prisoner of war, a Kodiak man, who had been taken prisoner by the enemy tribe in the Aleutian Islands. The tribes in Alaska fought each other, just like Europeans. They took prisoners of war. They held each other for ransom. They enslaved each other. And so this former slave POW from Kodiak Island was ransomed because he knew Russian. He had lived in other among the Russian Unangan people that he had learned Russian because Shalakov needed an interpreter. So he ransomed this prisoner of war, this man who had been taken prisoner from Kodiak, and brought him home. His name was Kashbak. We know his, his, uh, Unang, his Aleut name. And Kashbak was eternally grateful to the Russians, to Shalakov, for ransom, ransoming him and bringing him home. He spoke Russian, so they could say, now, these are your instructions, Kashbuk. Go to your own people with our gifts. Lots of blue beads. Maybe these people will like blue beads, too. <laughs> and other things, axes, uh, knives, frying pans, blankets. And say, we have come in peace, and all we want is to trade. But his, his relatives on Kodiak Island knew perfectly well what had been going on to their west. And they said, no, we're not interested. Tell your friends to go home. Get off our land. Leave us alone in peace. Cholikov was not willing to take no for an answer, so he sent Kashbak back a second time with all these gifts. His relatives said, Kashbak, tell your friends no, and don't try a third time. If you return as an emissary of these guys, we'll kill you. And then the local people retreated to what is today called Refuge Rock, a place on the opposite side of Kodiak Island where the tide creates... Uh, a peninsula at low tide and an island at high tide. Like Saint Mount Saint-Michel in Normandy, it's an island half the day and it's cliffs all around. So if you got there at high tide, you would wonder, how did people get up there? Because you have to go out and hit. But at low tide, there's a land bridge. Gushbach knows all this. He's from this area. So he leads Chelikov and his hired men and their bazookas to the beach, and they attack, they surprise attack, the people who think they're secure and safe in their refuge, in their citadel, and they surrender. Uh, there's reports of a massacre of about 200 people. Shalikov denies that in his reports, but it's quite true. Those people were militarily prepared to defend themselves, but it was the, basically the conquest of Kodiak Island and the Aleutian people. And then Shalikov wasn't trying to hurt these people or kill them. He needed them to run for him. There was no, there was no uh, advantage to killing them off, to massacring them. So I wonder, too, about these reports of hundreds of people killed, especially men, because especially the men you need for hunting. In any case, um, his terms were, you guys live on one side of the bay and we'll maintain our settlement on the opposite side. And then Chelkov went back to Russia. Seven years later, a Russian naval vessel visited this settlement at Three Saints Bay. And we have the reports. The chaplain there, just like in the Aleutian Islands later, was very busy that winter at Three Saints Bay, marrying the couples. So the same thing that had happened in the Aleutian Islands began happening in Kodiak. Marrying the couples and baptizing the babies. Seven years after the battle, there was already that kind of rapport between the hired men. Now, <laughs> Then Shalikov wanted, he wanted to put out, out of business all the, other, all the other competition. All these guys with their flimsy skin boats, forget that. We're going to do, get serious about this. We want the government to grant us a monopoly. His company is going to have complete control on the Alaskan fur trade. That's the idea. Well, only the empress can grant that. He was from Siberia, but he went all the way to St. Petersburg and somehow got an appointment with Catherine the Great. <clears throat> I don't know how he wrangled that. Very Shalikov was a real dealer. And a very charming man, apparently, because he talked his way in and out of all kinds of different situations. He presented himself to the Empress as the conqueror of Alaska. 
He claimed to have brought 20,000 new taxpayers into the empire. It wasn't more than 400. But Chelikov was good at exaggerating. And he claimed to have discovered new islands, which was not true. He discovered nothing. He claimed to have built a church, which was certainly not true. And he, he also claimed to have preached the gospel to the local people and personally baptized several dozen Olympic people, which is absolutely preposterous. But that's what he, he claimed. And because of this, he wanted to be rewarded. He wanted to be knighted. He wanted to become Sir Gregory Shalikov. Baron or Earl or Count Shalikov. He wanted a monopoly over the fur trade. He wanted a government uh, subsidy. He wanted troops to help guard his settlements. His, his list of requests was rather extravagant, and Catherine denied all of them. She was reading laissez-faire French economic theory. She was against monopolies, and she said, thank you, Gregory. She pinned a little medal on his chest and dismissed him. <laughs> But Frederick Shulikov was not a man to be so easily discouraged. He came back with another request. Your Majesty, uh, I would like to, your, your permission to, to recruit a priest to come with me back to Alaska because these people are thirsting for the knowledge of God and the Holy Gospel and they're eager to become Orthodox Christians. Catherine actually liked this idea. But reading is just, you ask for one priest but you, have, you claim that there are 20,000 of them. <laughs> One will not be enough for every. I give you permission to recruit 10 at your own expense. <laughs> you can imagine how happy Mr. Shalikov is. <laughs> now, where in the world is he going to get 10 priests to go to a country that's not even on the map? Uh, the, the wives will not agree. <laughs> so he gave up on recruiting married priests. But near St. Petersburg, a day's travel by boat, is the, one of the largest lavra, the, la, the great lavra of Balang. And so he sails up the Neva River to Balang. And there in the middle of Lake, Lake Ladoga, the largest lake in Europe, on the islands out there, the kind of place monks would love. It's frozen half the year. No one in their right mind would want to live out there on those islands. That's, of course, where they live, the monastery. He goes there and he preaches. He tells them all his lies. There's a church waiting for you. There's a rectory waiting for you. All your needs will be taken care of. Can I get ten monks to come? He got his ten monks. Now, Gregory Shulikov was ordered by the emperors to provide transportation. Shulikov's idea of transportation was to buy all ten of them new boots. <laughs> in the cathedral of St. Petersburg, they walked 8,000 miles. It's the longest missionary journey in the history of the Orthodox Church. The monks from Valam walked 8,000 miles to get to the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> and they sailed from Okhotsk to Kodiak, where in September of 1794 they arrived on the OCA stationery, I think that's the date. September 24th, I don't know if that's old or new calendar, we should check that. But September 24th, 1794, these 10 monks arrived in code, and they went into culture shock. It was nothing like Shelikov had explained. His propaganda was obvious. There was no church, there was no house for them to live in, and there was no food for them to survive. And what did they see? They saw the Alutic people of Kodiak Island being extorted, being forced at, at not at gunpoint, but at the uh, under threat of these bazookas, these cannon. Get out there and hunt. We need a hundred pelts today. If you don't fulfill your quota, we'll bomb your village. They weren't going to kill the people, but in August, for example, you've spent May, June, July, and August catching salmon and drying them for your winter food supply. If they blow up your smokehouse, You'll be hungry. Your children will be crying January, February, March. Okay, we'll go. And this is how they were filling their ships with furs. But these are the people the monks had come to convert. So you see the horrible position the monastic mission was in. They see their own countrymen exploiting and, I would say, it's even enslaving. <clears throat> not as a permanent class of slaves, but still extorting from them these furs, and they, they came to preach the gospel of peace. How is that going to be credible? 
So they spent the first six months kind of lying low because there's no way to telegraph back to St. Petersburg. There's no way to send a message. If you send a message, it has to go on the company ship. It won't be private, right? So they're kind of stuck. They're saying, how are we going to, to whom are we going to complain? They wrote to Shalokov in May of 1795, six months later. It's a very diplomatic letter. They say, our friend and benefactor, dear Gregory, uh, we, you know how much we, we, we love and respect you. However, nothing about what you described seems to be true. Uh, there is no church, there is no... But it's all because of your manager, Alexander Baranov. He must be simply disobeying all your commands, all your rules, all your guidelines. He's exploiting and enslaving and mistreating these people. And as we should point out to you, Mr. Chalikov, this is all blatantly illegal. It's against imperial decrees and Russian law, what they're doing to these uh, Alaskan Native people. And we should be reporting this to the government. But because we love and respect you so much, we 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 won't run further. We expect you will take care of this, won't you? That's their first letter back to, uh, to Shalikov. But they also write, six months after they've arrived, a very detailed analysis of the Kodiak Alutic religious beliefs. And they send this not to Shalikov, he probably wouldn't have been interested. They send it to Balaam, to their abbot. And so from Balaam, we see what those monks were doing those six months. They were sitting down, maybe with Gushbuck, someone had to translate. Uh, and, and asking the elders of the tribe, what do you believe about God? What do you believe about uh, spiritual life? And it turns out, they believed in one supreme creator in God. They believed in uh, the great, they had stories of the flood. They had the Ten Commandments, basically. You know, except for keeping the Sabbath day holy, all the others are pretty common sense rules. No tribe can live together and allow murder, adultery, theft, lying. People can't live together in community without basically figuring out the Ten Commandments apply here. They didn't call them the Ten Commandments, but the, what the monks say is, we can work with this. We have a foundation on which to build. We have a basic context out of which we can lay the foundations of a Christian culture. Did they have idols? No. Uh, so they didn't have temples or idols it wasn't like the ancient Mediterranean at all because these are tribal people right? without written language so um, they had a very positive analysis of the original indigenous belief system uh, and, and they have this analysis almost all tribes have stories of origins, the beginning of the world the Alaskans don't there's no story of how the world came into being it's just sort of there. Uh, and when you ask, well, why don't you have any stories or beliefs about that? The, the response is quite lo- logical, actually. And just think about it, Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God said, and it was so. But did CNN cover that? Are there any human beings, day 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5? Is it an eyewitness account? Obviously not, Right? The only way we would know how the world was created would be by, either by educated guess or divine revelation. But it's, it's something a little bit funny to, to challenge your fundamentalist friends with. Because the creation of the world is not a human being's witness because they weren't there. Where would they be standing watching God say, let there be light? <laughs> <laughs> Human beings don't come to the sixth day. So whatever happened in the first five, and there's no sun until the third day. So the word day cannot mean the same thing that means for us the earth rotating in 24 hours or in orbit around the sun. There isn't one. What we're saying, what the whole point of Genesis is to say, unlike the, Mediter- the ancient faiths of pagan faiths of the Mediterranean, the world is created by the will of God with a purpose and a direction. It's not, it's not the accidental byproduct of, in most of their mythologies, a clash, either uh, military or sexual, between the gods and the goddesses. <clears throat> it's not something that came out of something evil. It came out of <coughs> something very good, and God blessed it. That's, that's radically different from all the other faiths in the ancient Middle East. 
That's the point of Genesis. It's not a play-by-play account. The days aren't really days, and there are no human beings witnessing any of it. But the point is, it's deliberate and intentional. God planned it, God willed it, and it was so, and God called it very good and blessed it. There's none of that in the other faiths of the ancient Middle East. So this is what was radically different in, in the Jewish faith and what the book of Genesis is trying to communicate to us. In any case, when they ask the native people of Alaska, what's your story of the origins of the world, they really didn't have one. They have a story of the origins of the human beings. Because we were involved in that story from the very beginning, the first people. And I want to share that story with you because it's one of those, it's not related by the original Valam monks, but it's still told to this day. The first people arrived in Alaska. The word Alaska means the mainland, or the great land. It's at first that they probably came from the Aleutian Islands and then came into the main part of the main body of the state. The first people arrived in what is now rem- remembered as a, as a landing craft in the shape of a big clamshell. So you can see this device, whatever it was, washing ashore and opening up. And the first humans, however many, 10, 20, 50, I don't know, but a, a, a group of men, women, and children disembarking and stepping out onto the shore. And according to this story, and it's told by the Klingon people in the far eastern part of the state and the Yupik people in the far western part, it's pretty much a story all the Alaskan Native people still tell. Uh, Raven, the leader of the animals, was walking along the beach that morning. Raven encountered the first people he'd ever seen. Raven was not impressed. (laughs) What kind of thing are you, Raven said. Stubby little legs. Obviously you can't run. I've got deer and moose who can run faster than you. Uh, No feathers or wings. Obviously you can't fly. No claws worth anything. And your teeth? You call those pitiful. And worst of all, hardly any fur. We have this season called winter. (laughs) It lasts half the year. You have no future here. You're not going to last the entire winter season. You won't even survive the first blizzard. In 24 hours, you'll be extinct. I advise you to get back into your landing craft and return to wherever you came from. But the humans refused. We're staying here. I'm telling you, you have no future in this land. But they wouldn't leave. Okay, so Raven decided, maybe some of the other animals have a better idea. He called a convocation of all the Arctic animals. Look what I found on the beach. And the Alaskan animals looked at the first humans and quickly came to the same disparaging conclusion. Pathetic. Pitiful. Ridiculous. Doomed. Exactly, like it says. I tried to convince them they have no future in this country, but they won't leave. The animal said, Well, Raven, they're, they're kind of cute. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep them. <laughs> and Raven said, Well, I'm not against that. I just don't see how, practically speaking, it's possible. How are these pitiful, pathetic creatures going to survive in this country? So the animals huddled that day. They discussed the problem. And in the evening, they returned to Raven with this idea. They said, what if we give these pathetic, ridiculous creatures our fur and our feathers for cover? And what if we give them our flesh, our bodies, as food? Couldn't they survive then? Raven considered this. You know, that just might work. But why would you do that? What's in it for you? And the animal said, we will give these pathetic new creatures our feathers and fur so they can make coats and clothing to keep warm. And we will give them our bodies, our flesh, as meat so that they can survive. And in return, what we ask for is gratitude and respect. And that's the deal. The covenant, you could say, in Christian terms, that the human beings made with the animals. Now, none of this is written down. I learned this only by oral tradition myself. But the missionaries learned this, too. Now, that's something we can work with, isn't it? Huh? Uh, (laughs) In practical terms, it changes the way you see everything. 
I teach a course called Cross-Cultural Communication. In, in the old introductory section of that class, I challenge people to think about what a culture is. And I discovered from my students in the elementary school in Old Harbor, Three Saints Bay, Alaska, uh, that they saw the world differently from me. They spoke English, they ate pizza, they wore Eddie Bauer parkas and Nike cans. I was the only one among them in fourth century attire. <laughs> <laughs> but they saw the world differently. And I discovered it discussing animals with them. And they had to listen to the elders. What stories do you tell your kids about the animals? Kodiakalytic people to this day tell this story. Once upon a time, a long time ago, there was a grandmother and a grandson living all alone, and they were out of food. By the way, hundreds of stories start exactly the same way. <laughs> and the grandmother says to the boy, Grandson, we're out of food. You gotta go hunting. But I warn you, see that mountain over there? Don't go near it, don't touch it. See that bay? Stay out of that bay, of that forest. That's a very dangerous place. Don't go into that forest. Not that forest, not that bay, not that mountain. He's a teenage boy. <laughs> You all know where he's going, don't you? <laughs> and so does Grandma. She rushes down to the beach as he's about to launch out in his kayak, and she says, oh, and take this with you. And what, what she's giving him looks like a shriveled up piece of fur. Why are you giving me this old, you know, he's thinking in terms of rabbit foot, you know, rabbit for a good luck. No, no, no. If you get yourself into any kind of dangerous predicament, you can use this piece of fur. How am I going to use this old piece of fur, Grandma? You'll see. If you find yourself in danger, you chew on it, stretch it, soften it up, and pull it over your head. Yeah, right. He had no pockets, so he stuffed that big skin up his sleeve and paddled straight to the mountain he wasn't supposed to touch. He doesn't just touch it, he starts to climb up. Halfway up the mountain, there's an earthquake and a landslide, and he's buried alive in the dirt. He's choking, he's running out of oxygen. He's going he's gonna to suffocate. No one will ever find him. In a panic, he remembers Granny's mink skin. He pulls it out. He chews on it. He stretches it. He pulls it over his head, and instantly he's transformed into a mink. In the shape of a mink, he burrows his way out to the surface. He removes the mink skin and turns himself back into a boy and resumes his adventures, which I'll skip for the most part. He goes to the other places he's not supposed to go, clearly but survives by changing himself into a mink and back into a human. On the way home, he comes to a lake teeming with fat, plump, happy, contented, frolicking mink. And it looks like they're having so much fun. He pulls out that mink skin, he chews on it, he stretches it, he pulls it over his head, he turns himself into a mink and lives happily ever after. The first time I heard that story, I was perplexed. In my culture, European or Middle Eastern culture, to be turned into an animal is a curse. It's a put-down. It's certainly a demotion, <laughs> right? So I, I had to go back to the elders. Why do you tell your children this story? And they say, so they will respect the animals. And then as you interview more, what they're saying is this. Life, in whatever form you encounter it, is a sacred reality that must be treated with reverence. Life in the human being and life in the animal is, in, in, in essence, the same thing. It's sacred in us, it's sacred in them. Alaska Native art depicts this in certain ways. In Klingit art, you'll have a mask on the outside that's the shape of an animal, and it will open with the face of a human being on the inside. That's the message. The life inside the animal despite what the outer shape may be, is the same as the life in us. In Eskimo, Yupik art and Inupiak art, it's the face of an animal, and one eye is the face of a human being. It's the same message. The life within is the same as yours. Treat it with respect. Treat it with reverence. Now, why, why would the missionaries try to overthrow that idea? Think of it for a minute in our theology. In him was life. Gospel of Pascha, right? Egoimi mm -hmm. to cosmo. To cosmo. 
I am the life of the world. I, I, I cite this, like John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he sent his son. In Greek, most of you probably know, there are two words for world. There's the word ikumeni, which means all the people of the world. And there's the word cosmos, the whole creation. The stars, the moon, the planets, the, the animals, the, the, the oceans, uh, the forests, and the tundra. Cosmos, the whole creation, ikumeni, just the people. In John 3.16, in the original Greek, which word does the original scripture say? Ikumeni, for God so loved all the people of the world that he sent his son, or for God so loved the creation, the whole cosmos, that he sent his son. Here's something lost in translation, isn't it? Because the word is cosmos. God so loved the whole creation that he sent his son. So how could our missionaries say to these people, oh, that's a pagan idea, that's no good. You, can't, you should treat the animals as inferior creatures and don't bother to respect them. How could they say that? And then you see, as you understand the Christian gospel, certainly in sacramental terms, I have no way of knowing when this was translated into any of our Alaska native languages. I know that everybody sees it now in English. So the idea has certainly penetrated by now. How early, I don't know, but what do we sing on Holy Saturday at the entrance here? No, the entrance in. Let all mortal flesh. Let all mortal flesh keep silent. In fear and trembling stand, pondering nothing, earthly minded. <clears throat> then, for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords comes to be slain, to give himself as food to the faithful. You see how that resonated with these people? Mm. Oh, what we always believed about the animals is what God himself has done. So the patterns repeat. Right? There's a bigger pattern. God comes to earth to put on flesh, to be slain, to give himself to us as the heavenly bread of a cup of water. But we always believed this about the animals. And the life in the animals is the same as the life in us because it's all Christ. Isn't that mind blowing? <laughs> you see, we thought we understood it in English. But you know, it really, and it's very difficult to explain it just to go back to the ancient Greek by itself. But filtered through the experience of Alaska, what I'm saying is. There's a way of suddenly renewing and expanding our understanding of our own faith that was always there. It's not something that we're adding or changing, but we missed it. We didn't see it until we could explain it through the lens now, is what I'm proposing, through the lens of the experience of the last eight peoples. Because suddenly you will never hear that thing again and think of it as <coughs> Right? So the, to me, as I read back, as best I can, the experience of these people hearing the gospel and the missionaries respecting what they already believe, not attacking this. In fact, it's still very much there, but again, it's not written about. So when I went to this region, the first time Western Alaska, my two high school, one junior, one senior, invited me to the village. I'd never been to this part of Alaska. I was trying to learn their language. I have lived in the Aleutic area, Kodiak Island, three saints day, one year. I had lived in southeast Alaska by the cathedral in the Tlingit area another year. And now these students who were Yupik Eskimo invited me to come and visit their region. This is the area evangelized by St. Yaakov Netzviatov, whom we'll talk about this afternoon. And uh, they were singing everything in Yupik, the whole service, Vespers, Matins, they had it all translated. No one had a book, they knew it all by heart. It was amazing to go to church there, to have uh, 200 people, 300 people in church. I was singing the, uh, every, the great doxology. Oh, when they sang, having beheld the resurrection after the gospel reading. Well, it was overwhelming. But by heart, they had memorized it and internalized this, and they could sing with great enthusiasm without books. So I, went to, I had to see this part of Alaska. My two students, the ones who had invited me to the village, told me 
After a couple of days, we're going hunting, come with us. I'd never been hunting in my life. We went out on the river. It's water everywhere. There was an ice jam. The ice going out in the spring had kind of stuck 20 miles below us and created a huge lake all around us. <coughs> you had to go from house to house, like in Venice, by boat, until the ice jam broke. Lots of water, water everywhere. We came home that afternoon, <coughs> and I'm thinking 10 or 12 muskrats. I think they gave themselves to us. They had no, no place to rest. They just got so tired paddling around. Here, take me. <laughs> I was living in a cabin with an elderly couple about as big as the area where you're sitting. Just a one, one room log cabin. With two elders who didn't speak English because I was trying to learn their language. And in my experience, the best way to learn is to be just thrown in and speak no English and just listen. After about six weeks, you start to understand most. And after a summer, you understand almost everything. You still can't speak very well. Your grammar is still deficient and you can't pronounce properly, but you, you get the gist. So that's what I was trying to do that summer. So we presented these 10 or 12 months back to the lady of the house. She skinned and gutted them. And she put them into a big 20 gallon, the meat into a big 20 gallon uh, cook pot. The fur was removed and put on little stretchers to dry out behind, behind the wood stove. Something that'll be somebody's coat when you get enough of them. But now the meat needed to be cooked. And then she set the table. She set the table with spoons around the circumference, ten spoons. We were going to have guests apparently for dinner because we had so much meat. And then she, she brought a bucket into the house. We didn't have plumbing. You had to bring water from the well. She brought a bucket of cold water and put washcloths into it. And she pulled these out and wrung them out and placed the washcloths down the middle of the table. I've never seen anyone do this, and I had no idea what this was about, but I'll find out. And I did. She called everyone to the table. We said a prayer, and sat down, and she, like a waitress, delivered to each person supper. Stew, soup, muskrat soup, vegetables, carrots, potatoes, rice, onions, and in each bowl. <laughs> One muskrat, teeth, paws. <laughs> I tell you, I didn't know what to do with this. <laughs> I had a spoon. How do you, how do you eat a creature this big sitting there in your soup? <laughs> Everyone, I realize now, had been invited to show me how. It's very eupic. You don't talk about it. You don't give verbal instructions. You observe and imitate. <clears throat> And everyone there knew exactly how to eat this. They went right into the bowl with their hands. They removed the meat with their fingers. It wasn't so hot that you couldn't put your hands into the broth, but that gets messy. Well, that's what the washcloths were for, silly. So I imitated them as best I could. My senior, he's now the chief of police in the village, he was sitting next to me. He was, he was delighting in my initiation <laughs> in this culture. <laughs> He kept nudging me with his elbow, <laughs> pointing at my supper, and whispering into my ear, rats, <laughs> rats, <laughs> you're eating rats. <laughs> I remember psychologically co coaxing myself through this meal, thinking two things to myself. First of all, you're eating it too, buddy. And secondly, I don't know what they put into hot dogs, either. <laughs> Thinking in this way, I completed my supper. The cook, my teacher, came back, came over to me when she saw I was no longer eating, and asked me, are you finished? Da ka. I thought I was ready, but done. So I said, yes, e. And she began to remove my bowl. But she was my teacher. And when I answered correctly, she smiled at me and nodded. She wasn't smiling now, nor was she nodding. The facial expression was of disappointment. I had to change my answer. Duck side go. I'm not done yet. And she returned my bowl and walked away. The problem was I didn't know why I wasn't done yet. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody else was still busy. They were separating every bone, no matter how tiny, from every other bone. And wherever there was the tiniest little speck of meat, often with great 
effort and noise. They were consuming, I would say inhaling. <laughs> you, you had 10 people at the table going. <laughs> <laughs> There's a word for this in Yupik, and it's, it's really the height of good manners. Uh, Tupokok means to assiduously and carefully remove the meat from the bones of an animal so that none of it will be wasted as a sign of gratitude and respect for the animal that died to feed you. And so in our, <coughs> in our system of etiquette, the European style, the goal is to be quiet and neat. Yeah. Emily Post, you can boil down all the rules to be quiet and be neat. This was neither quiet nor neat. I simply say it's a different ball game. The rules are different. The, balls, the ball game rules of one culture don't apply here. Quiet and neat is not the goal. Waste nothing is the goal. And so with some, some effort and some feeling somewhat awkward, I also began to separate every little bone and wherever there was a little bit of meat, a little speck. After 10, 15 more minutes, the cook returned looking at me. No tan ka takoten. Now you're done, aren't you? Not so confident the second time around. Somewhat sheepishly, I looked up at her. E. <laughs> and she said, E. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how you learn. I'm sure our missionaries had exactly the same experience 200 years before me. <clears throat> they heard the same stories, and they learned there's nothing wrong with this. Why do we say grace and ask God to bless something and then throw half of it in the trash? Isn't that a sin? Huh? And these people already... This was a living thing. Now, when you're a hunter or a fisherman, you know it was a living thing because you had to kill it yourself. And then there are these protocols, this way of treating this living thing with the proper respect the humility and the gratitude, which goes back to that story <coughs> I already told you. That's how people see the world. That's how people interact with their food. I think our kids today need these stories. Because we're so wasteful in our country. And they say, you know, how much, I don't know their statistics on how much gets wasted and thrown away. I don't mind this. Please. <laughs> right? We're, we're, we really are spoiled. But it's really hard, I have to say, it's really hard, on the other hand, to take seriously that that chicken in the styrofoam platter with the saran wrap over it was ever a living thing. We just don't have the experience of that. And when it comes in a box already breaded in chunks, you see what I'm saying? We're out of touch with the reality of this. It was a living thing that had to die to feed you. That deserves respect but it's much harder to maintain when it comes in a can or a box. And when it comes between two, two hamburger buns, it's almost impossible to imagine that that was once a cow. <laughs> so I don't blame the kids today for not having the same kind, but when you live in that culture, and it's the fish you yourself caught, you don't want to see it thrown away and wasted. And so we live in this kind of environment where this, this comes naturally. It's part of the world you live in, and therefore, there's a protocol. You have to be careful how you can talk about the animals, because they're on probation, and they're listening. Mm-hmm. I don't know how much time we still have, but I want to tell more story. But, um... It's 10.30. 11.30. 11.30. Let me tell this, so then we'll go to lunch, okay? Because we're listening. We won't waste. We won't waste the <laughs> for supper. No, we or for lunch. No, this is supper exactly like this. The boy spoke disrespectfully of the animals. <coughs> you have to be careful what you're saying. They're listening. They have better ears than we do. Uh, it's all a mystery. Uh, how if the deer have big ears and can hear you, and big noses and can smell you? How do you ever catch one? Why don't they just run away? The answer is they give themselves to you. And I have been on such runs. I'm like in a boat, you know, you're at the lowest point of the ecosystem, down in the water. It might be 10 feet of riverbank on either side. All the caribou are up here. When you're down in the boat, you can't see them. But I've been in such a boat where the caribou came down to us. And we have a very loud outboard motor on the boat. It's not like we're being quiet and sneaking up on them. When you have three hunters in the boat and three caribou come, 
and to jump into the river in front of you and step out of the sandbar 50 feet in front of you, they're giving themselves to you. And you receive it as a gift and respond to it. Now the story is grandmother and grandson living all alone and they're out of food. The same thing given as before. <laughs> and the grandmother says, you've got to go hunting. And the boy says, I'll be right back. He shouldn't have said that. It's not up to him. His success is not up to him. He can be strong and intelligent and a good marksman, but it's not up to him whether he's going to catch any fruit. So the animals say, hide. <laughs> he walks all day and finds nothing. He's exhausted. He's tired. The sun is going down. He finally collapses on a driftwood log and stretches out his tired, weary feet. And just then, as he's almost ready to doze off, a kind of shrew, a mouse, runs right over his foot, right over his boot. He jumps up. What was that? He sees it's that little mouse, and he chases it with a stick and clunks it. Now he's got the catch of the day. <laughs> but it's this tiny little mouse. He said he'd be right back. If he walks all night, he can get home to Granny. He knows what she'll do. She'll boil it. They'll have mouse soup for breakfast, and he'll get half of a bite, and she'll get the other half, and they'll both be starving, and he'll have to come all the way out here again tomorrow to hunt. It's not worth it. I'm not taking the mouse home. <laughs> Grandma will probably laugh at me. You've been gone all day and all night, and all you bring me is a... No. I have to keep up my strength. She's just sitting in the house sewing or something. I'm doing all the work. Thinking of this way, he eats the mouse. The next day he resumes his hunt. He comes to a pond the size of this snake. In that pond there are muskrats. Most of the muskrats flee to the far side to avoid capture, but one of them feels sorry for this hungry, tired, starving boy and swims toward him. The boy pulls out an arrow and shoots the muskrat. Now he's got lunch on a stick. <laughs> Enough meal for one person. He should take it home to Grandma, but if he takes it home to Grandma... He'll have to share it with her. She'll get half of it, four or five bites. He'll get the other four or five bites. And they'll both be starving. It's not worth it. I've got to keep up my strength. I'll get something better for Grandma tomorrow. You get the pattern here. He eats the muskrat. The next day he comes to a lake as big as this property in which there's a beaver dam. Most of the beaver flee to the safety of their beaver house. But one beaver feels sorry for this poor, hungry, starving boy and comes close enough for the boy to spear that beaver. Well, the beaver is plenty of meat, enough to feed someone for a family of two for at least a week. But the boy's so hungry, he eats the whole beaver without even thinking of his grandma. The next day, he gets to the sea coast and kills a seal. A seal weighs as much as an adult human being. He eats the whole seal. The next day, he kills a walrus. Weighs maybe a ton. He eats the whole walrus. The next day, he kills a sea lion. Two or three tons worth of meat. A sea lion can be as long as one of these rows of chairs. They're huge. He's the whole sea lion. <laughs> By now he's standing as tall as his church building. <laughs> he's becoming a big, fat, ugly monster. But he's still hungry. The final day he finds a beach whale the size of this wall. He eats the whole whale. <laughs> <laughs> now he's bigger than any dinosaur that grown deer. He's a big, fat, ugly giant or monster and he's thirsty. So he swallows the sea, the Bering Sea. This makes him larger, bigger, and more terrifying than any dinosaur that ever roamed the earth. The biggest, fattest, ugliest giant that ever uh, crushed, and every step shakes the ground and creates an earthquake. <laughs> I love doing this in kindergarten with a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> and he gets to the house in seven giant steps because he's so huge. What he took seven or eight days to walk as a boy, now he covers in a few minutes. The ground is shaking. Grandma hears this monster approaching. And he comes to the house. But the house, compared to his huge size, is the size of my shoe compared to me. He suddenly realizes what's happened to him. Granny's in there. And she calls out. Who's there? She's starving. She hasn't eaten in a week now. The boy yells, don't worry, Grandma. It's just me. She calls out to him. Well then, come in, dear. He answers, I can't. And he starts to cry. He's still only a 14-year-old boy. Grandma calls out innocently, Why not? He answers, I brought home too much food. Which isn't exactly a lie. 
Grandma says, that's okay. You can come in through the smoke hole, through the roof. Now, traditionally, people lived as if, you might have mentioned if you were last night, they lived in these sod houses that looked like igloos, but really weren't. They looked like igloos if, they, if it had snowed. But they have a domed roof and a smoke hole in the middle. Grandma's saying, come in that way. How is he going to come in that way? It doesn't make any sense, does it? But he doesn't dare disobey. He plants one huge foot on one side of the house and one huge foot on the opposite side. And then Grandma calls up to him, Now jump in head first. Head first. As if he were a gymnast or on a diving board or a trampoline. He bends his knees. He throws his whole body up to do a flip. And as his head descends toward the roof of that house, Grandma inside holds up her magical ivory sewing needle. He passes through the eye, through the hole of that needle. She transforms him back into his normal size, and out of him comes the ocean, the whale, the walrus, the sea lion, all that food. And the story traditionally ends with Grandma saying to the boy, Oh, grandson, what a good provider you are. That's a very old story, and I've heard it dozens of times. But the meaning is something much deeper. The boy did not catch anything because the animals were offended about what he said. Be careful what you say. Traditional people all over the world, and I would really like to interview people from other continents, but I know in our continents, it's what you say that has power, not what you write. Anyone who's dealt with the federal government and treaties knows that what's written doesn't count. It can be changed tomorrow and ignored permanently. This is the experience of Indian tribes across the entire continent, right? What you write doesn't matter. What you say can never be taken back. One of my students, a senior in college, saw my first book, not Orthodox Alaska, but a previous one. She saw it on my desk, she flipped through it, and she said, really nice, Father Michael, but none of these words ever happened. What do you mean they never happened? She said they were never spoken. They're only written words. I can trash your book, I can shred it, I can burn it. They never happened. And then she, she went like this, but the words I say, the words I say go off to the ends of the universe and you can never take them back. I submit to you this is a totally different idea of language than we have. It's not a real thing until it's spoken or sung which means the liturgy must be spoken and sung, and the word must be preached. Passing out pamphlets and reading it silently in the corner doesn't count. It's not real language until it's performed, until God spoke and it was so. Anyway, the spoken word, that's one, that's one a- aspect of this. But the real aspect of the story is raising boys to become men. We have no clear criteria for this in our culture. You ask, I ask teenage boys all the time, when are you going to grow up? When will you be a man? And they think in legal terms, when I'm 18, when I'm 21, it's automatic as soon as you reach a certain age. And I respond to them, I'm sorry, but I know 30, 40, and 50-year-old boys. A boy, or girl for that matter, is a child because as babies, as infants, we are self-centered. A baby wants what it wants, and a baby wants it now and will take no mercy on the parents. It will scream until it gets what it needs. So if a diaper needs changing or the baby is too hot, too cold, thirsty or hungry, the baby will yell until it, it gets what it demands. We're all like that. But growing up is not just a matter of getting larger in size. It's a matter of gradually realizing that life is not about what I want, what I like, and what gives me pleasure or comfort. We have people in our society who believe that, and they are 30 and 40 and 50 years old. Because it's all about me, 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 and me. A boy becomes a man. In in tribal societies, and I believe this should be true in all societies, a boy becomes a man in a tribal society as he becomes a provider for others. He hunts, but he hunts the opposite of the boy in my story. When he catches, he offers to others. He doesn't hunt to feed himself. If he hunts only to feed himself, he's grown up to be a selfish monster. If he's hunting to bring up food to provide for others, he's becoming a man. But the boy must voluntarily become the servant of something other than, and more important than, himself. If a boy doesn't learn that, the probability of his becoming a monster you don't want in the house 
is very high. You see, there's this parable embedded in the story. What does it take to be a man? So because of the story, and we have similar stories in all our cultures, when a boy in any culture in Alaska, they're all learning to be hunters, when he catches his first of something, his first mouse, his first duck, his first goose, his first muskrat, his first beaver, his first caribou, he eats none of it. He gives it away. It's all given away. The family at home may celebrate. They may have something like a birthday party. Invite the neighbors. My son got his first beaver. My son got his first seal. It'll be a celebration. But the seal itself is given to others because he's becoming a provider. He does not living it just for what? For himself. The <coughs> school advisors who say to a kid, stay in school and you too can make lots of money and move to the city and have a nice house and a car and all the convenience doesn't work. The only way I'm convinced we can get the average traditional kid to buy into higher education <laughs> from this culture is to say you have to be like a hunter, like in the old days. But you're not going to bring home the knowledge to serve your people. That will resonate. Telling him you can separate yourself from the group and go into town and live happily ever after for your own comfort and kids have been raised on my story that I have the needle. You see, it's a cultural clash. But how did the monks live? Without any personal possessions sharing everything, providing for each other. You see how monastic life resonated. So the monks were hardly successful. St. Herman and, and the monks not only wrote letters of protest blowing the whistle on the company, they did that. They wound up under house arrest. St. Herman didn't move to Spruce Island to pray. St. Herman moved to Spruce Island four miles away to get out of harm's way. They were trying to kill him in Kodiak. He was, writing the, he was blowing the whistle on the whole operation. And he had to get out of the city because he, there were three assassination attempts on his life. That's not in our liturgical text. It's not in the Agathe. First monk of our land, founder of monasticism in our land, holy father of prayer and fasting. Yeah, that's all true. But that's not why the Alleys loved him. The Alley people loved him because he had the courage to stand up for what was right. And because the monks were sensitive enough to listen to the stories like I just told you and say, we can affirm that. We can agree with that. We can bless that. We can add something more to it. The rest of the story is used to say on the radio. We can give them the gospel, but the gospel doesn't contradict what these people already know. And in fact, we're enriched by meeting these people. Let all mortal flesh keep silent. The king of kings and lord of lords comes to be slain to give himself as food to the faithful. It takes on a whole new meaning for the missionaries. So we're both benefiting in this dialogue, right? It's not, I know everything and what you know doesn't count. It's evil, it's bad, it's demonic, whatever. That is precisely the approach most missionaries around the world took toward indigenous people, with disastrous consequences and results. But if we have anything to brag about as Orthodox in our mission, our monks didn't do it that way. And the reason they did this, they walked across Siberia. <laughs> <laughs> And every, time, every night they stopped, there was no Marriott or Holiday Inn, right? Motel 6. Where did they stop night after night? In the next monastery, and the next monastery, and the next monastery, each of which had been built beyond the frontiers of the empire in its day. And they heard the stories of how they had evangelized the tribes there. So when they got to Kodiak, they knew exactly how to proceed. Not because they were well-educated, they weren't professional missionaries. But they sat there and listened to the stories, they embraced the people. They took their side against their country. They blew the whistle on the fur company. And they introduced Christianity as the fulfillment of what the people already knew. This is a missiological principle. How do we bring people to Christianity? Not by attacking American culture. Not by attacking American society. But finding what those places where the church is the fulfillment of what people already know. There's plenty to criticize in American culture, but if you start your mission by condemning, you'll go nowhere. We can't stand out the city gates and denounce Western civilization. Somehow we have to find what's good and pleasing to God in it, affirm that, and build on that. And we have sex in America, 
And there's plenty to criticize, I'm not saying that. There's plenty to criticize in American society and it's moving away from, from, the, from the gospel. But we won't get anywhere by simply denouncing. I, my final point, I was in Russia for a year and when I left, when I was leaving, the faculty at our institute said, Father Michael, you've been in a whole year. What have you learned about Russia that you'll take back to America? This is 20 years ago. And I said, I have been to many conferences and I've heard many not probably, uh, presentations, and I know very well what the people, what the Orthodox people and clergy are against in Russia. Because they're against every sect that came in. We know why we don't agree with the Hare Krishnas. We know why we don't agree with and we're against the Seventh-day Adventists. We know why we're... I have heard hundreds of speeches about what we're against this year. And not one speech about what we stand for. Mission is based on what we stand for. It can't be based on what we stand against. We can't be so negative, denouncing and condemning. What do we stand for? Forgiveness, patience, kindness, love. That's what we should be talking about. Not, you know, the late Supreme Court decision on abortion. Yes, we're against abortion. But why? Because we're in favor of life and love. Talk about the positive. This is what our missionaries did. And they did so heroically, even though they were in, it even endangered their lives. But they spoke out with courage about what they were for. And I believe it's chapter two of our, his, of our missions and our missiological principles from Alaska. We also have to learn from them and, and speak out forcefully and courageously, not for what we are against, but what we stand for in a positive way. Because that's the only way any mission has ever succeeded in the history of Orthodox. And now it's lunchtime. So.